Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Caroline Spry, and I'm the co-chair of National Archaeology Week. And you're joining us for the fourth of our National Archaeology Week 2022 national webinar series, which is going to be another terrific one. I'd just like to uh, acknowledge that I'm presenting from the lands traditionally known as Rundri Warren country in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm going to pass over now to Tracy Island, who is director, Professor Tracy Island is director of the Centre for Creative and Cultural Research at the University of Canberra and president of Australia ICOMOS. She was awarded a PhD in archaeology from the University of Sydney in 2002 and she's known internationally for her research on heritage practice and the relationships between archaeology, conservation and heritage in the post-colonial world. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, it's lovely to be here this evening um, and um, to, to join in to National um, Archaeology Week. So first of all, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of country and Australia ICOMOS, um, which is of course a national chapter of an international organisation, um, has a, a special acknowledgement um, that uh, was endorsed by our um, Indigenous Heritage Reference Group. So I'm going to um, refer to my notes to, um, to uh, read out our special acknowledgement. So Australia ICOMOS, across the lands and waters, states and territories, acknowledges that we're meeting on the land of the first Australians. We know that this land was never ceded, and we respect the rights and interests of Australia's first people in land, culture and heritage. We acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and support the concepts of voice, treaty and truth in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. So I would like to acknowledge that I'm zooming in today from uh, Ngunnawal country in the Yass Valley near near Canberra um, and I would like to extend my respect to um, all um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people zooming in tonight and to all First Nations people um, of other lands. So it's great to have this opportunity to introduce the um, the work um, of ICOMOS and the concerns of ICOMOS um, to to this uh, group and, um, and of course I'm joined by my two um, esteemed colleagues, uh, Professor Richard Mackay and Dr. Andrew Sneddon. Um, it's great to get the band back together guys. Um, and um, <laughs> we're going to hear from uh, Richard uh, first, who will take the, the global, um, perspective um, and then uh, Andrew will um, reverse zoom back in um, and and look a little bit more um, at the at the local perspective. So I suppose one of the interesting things about becoming um, uh, involved in the work um, of ICOMOS and Australia ICOMOS is the way in which it makes these connections between um, global and local scales and that's one of the most um, I suppose rewarding aspects um, of, uh, of the work of ICOMOS and it certainly contributes to broadening um, our, our perspectives. I wanted to mention this evening um, for all of you who might be um, considering becoming a member of Australia ICOMOS um, that we have um, a fabulous uh, journal called Historic Environment which is actually in its 42nd year um, of production um, and that's great, um, access to the journal is a great um, benefit of membership, but of course it's also really important to us that it's an open access journal. It has heaps of archaeological content. Um, of course it's a multidisciplinary journal and um, Australia ECOMOS uh, represents many disciplines. And I'll just give a little advertisement for the latest edition um, of uh, Historic Environment, um, which was edited um, by 
my own research team um, of me, Sally Brockwell and Ashley Harrison, drawn from our Heritage of the Air project, which is kind of an example of um, how archaeological methods, heritage studies, heritage studies, studies methods and material culture methods might all come together um, to produce new insights into the experience of the heritage of modernity. Okay, so now I'm going to um, introduce um, Professor Richard Mackay, um, known to many of you, I'm sure. Um, Richard is um, an archaeologist who's directed many large scale historical archaeological projects and published very widely um, across archaeological heritage man management. Richard's an adjunct professor at Deakin University in their wonderful um, heritage studies, um, heritage and museum studies program there. Um, and he's also an ICOMOS World Heritage Advisor and a member of the Australian ICOMOS uh, Executive Committee. And perhaps most importantly for what we're going to talk about this evening, he also has the really um, important and um, daunting job of being convener of the 2023 ICOMOS um, General Assembly and Scientific um, Symposium. And he'll go on to tell us a little bit uh, more about that. So it's my pleasure to um, introduce you, Richard, and the, the digital screen is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And um, I'm presuming that you can all now see the screen. So thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Caroline. Um, and good evening, friends and colleagues. I am speaking to you from Gadigal land, part of the Aora Nation. And I acknowledge that and I pay my respects to Gadigal elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to any First Nations uh, participants who have joined this evening. Um, I'm going to speak briefly about ICOMOS. I'm going to highlight some of the work that ICOMOS does in the World Heritage System and particularly in relation to archaeology. And then as Tracy has foreshadowed, uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, General Assembly and Scientific Symposium of ICOMOS, which will be hosted in Sydney in uh, August and September next year, 2023. Perhaps the first thing to say um, is that contrary to popular belief and uh, humour, ICOMOS is not a Greek island. Um, ICOMOS is the International Council on Monuments and Sites. It's a non-government organisation, uh, it's not for profit, and its um, role is involved in conservation, protection, use and enhancement of the world's cultural heritage. And ICOMOS is best known glo globally as one of the official advisory bodies to the World Heritage Committee. Uh, and it has a statutory international role in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention. Uh, specifically, it evaluates World Heritage nominations and it also advises on the state of conservation of properties that are inscribed on the World Heritage List. And as Tracy has mentioned in her kind introduction, um, my principal international role with ICOMOS is in the second of those two tasks, that is dealing with the state of conservation of properties already on the list. ICOMOS has been around since 1965 and it was formed following the adoption of the Venice Charter in 1964. The Venice Charter is very Eurocentric, but it is a, an important precursor to the Australian Borough Charter adopted in 1979, about which Andrew Sneddon is going to say a little more uh, very shortly. But just quickly in terms of the, the three advisory bodies, and I'm not proposing that you um, can read everything that's on the screen, but under the World Heritage Convention, it's, relative, it's relevant to know that there are three advisory bodies, IUCN or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature uh, based in Glande in Switzerland is very focused on uh, natural sites, both nominations and state of conservation reporting. Uh, ICOMOS, as I've mentioned, is looking at particular cultural sites, evaluation of nominations and advice on the state of conservation. And ICROM, based in Rome, uh, advises on conservation, but is predominantly focused on training activities and capacity building. And the three advisory bodies collaborate and work very closely together. Now, in terms of ICOMOS, um, it's, it's a very large voluntary organisation. 
Um, just right now, it's got 10,546 ICOMOS members. Um, there'll probably be another dozen in Australia on Saturday when our National Executive Committee meets. There are 107 national committees. So um, the national committees are, are organised units within ICOMOS. So in 107 nations, there are formal committees. And then um, there are individual members in other countries taking the total country membership representation to 152. Importantly, ICOMOS has 29 international scientific committees, and these cover a really broad range of conservation areas um, between things like uh, philosophy of conservation to polar heritage, vernacular architecture, technical things like the conservation of wood or management things like cultural tourism. In terms of being a member of ICOMOS, um, it's possible to be a full member if you are an individual with sufficient expertise and experience in conservation. And for those of you who are contemplating membership of Australia ICOMOS, you know, please just Google Australia ICOMOS membership, it'll take you straight to the website. Um, but uh, institutions and organisations with expertise or experience in conservation are also welcome. Uh, those who might be uh, emerging professionals without the full suite of uh, requisite expertise can be affiliate members. And then there are also honorary um, members, a, a rare status that's conferred by a global general assembly. And one of the important things about ICOMOS is that it, it, it encompasses a very broad range of cultural heritage practice, architecture, archaeology, historians, art historians, geographers, anthropologists, engineers, town planners and the like. Uh, importantly, ICOMOS is place-based. And while of course um, ICOMOS gets involved in matters pertaining to intangible cultural heritage or movable heritage where it's related to places, it is a, an organisation that is about monuments and sites, so very much about places. And relevantly, it provides a professional linkage between um, public institutions, government, uh, the academy, and those who are in private practice. So it, it provides a very important platform, really strongly evident within Australia of um, professional connectivity between um, different parts of um, professional practice in cultural heritage. And just to give you a sort of global snapshot with apologies to anyone tuned in from the Pacific, which seems to be um, missing from this map. Um, ICOMOS global coverage is pretty extensive, um, fairly evident that there's a little bit of work to do in Central Asia and a lot of work to do in Africa, but um, ICOMOS um, presence around the globe is, is growing and continues to grow um, on an annual basis. Uh, again, I'm not proposing to dwell for a long time on this diagram, except to say that it is a highly participatory democratic organisation in which major decisions are made by a global general assembly um, and national committees are entitled to vote based, based on their membership and that general assembly is held uh, on an annual basis but with a major general assembly every three years. Uh, there is an elected board, uh, there is then a, an executive bureau, uh, there is an advisory committee comprised of chairs of national and expert international scientific committees and there is at the bottom of the screen, a very small secretariat um, based in Paris, comprising a director general and the three units that are on screen who cover administration, uh, World Heritage and the ICOMOS Documentation Centre. So what does ICOMOS actually do? Well, it has a range of programs globally, uh, some conducted on a professional paid basis and some conducted by very active and enthusiastic network of volunteers. Um, broadly speaking, and I'm conscious that you will be able to read faster than I can talk, uh, ICOMOS promotes best practice, and it does that through um, doctrinal texts and charters, and uh, one of the most famous and well used of them is Australia's uh, borough charter, the Australia ICOMOS Charter for Places, for Cultural Heritage Places. ICOMOS disseminates knowledge uh, through uh, publications, through a really extensive online documentation centre, and I'll uh, tell you later where you can get to that, and through a widely used open archive. 
ICOMOS is directly involved in a number of international conventions. I've already mentioned the World Heritage Convention, but also conventions on underwater cultural heritage, uh, intangible heritage, and the 1954 Hague Convention relating to heritage and conflict. ICOMOS issues alerts on threats and, and, and is an advocate. ICOMOS, for example, has taken a very active role in relation to current implications for cultural heritage of uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, ICOMOS fosters and undertakes its own education and training activities, but also co collaborates very strongly with ICROM. It fosters proactively research in emerging areas, and it's basically about enriching the cultural heritage profession and facilitating the development of members. In terms of the Secretariat, uh, I'm not going to read every word on screen except to say it's small. There's 11 of them, um, plus some volunteers who come in from time to time. Uh, only five of those people cover the 1,200 plus places on the World Heritage List and all the nominations. Um, and then, of course, ICOMOS relies extremely heavily on the work of volunteers, um, three, three senior officers, five members of the Executive Bureau, and importantly, approximately 265 global experts uh, who undertake desktop and technical reviews and sometimes undertake uh, advisory or monitoring missions to World Heritage properties. And then finally, within the ICOMOS headquarters in Paris, there is a documentation centre, a really extensive archive of images, uh, reports, thematic reports and site-based reports, which is largely accessible um, online. So ICOMOS gets involved heavily in the state of conservation for properties that are on the World Heritage List, and that's done through its monitoring and advisory unit. Now that's just two people, a director and an assistant, plus a whole series of advisors and experts uh, worldwide. And I, I put up some figures that are a little bit dated here, and I did that because um, I, I jumped back to 2018 and 2019, which is really more representative of a typical year um, in the world of ICOMOS rather than using the last couple of years, which has been somewhat pandemic affected. So to give you an idea of how much work ICOMOS does in this space, um, at the request of the World Heritage Committee, there were 10 reactive monitoring missions. So these are, these are in-country investigations done at the request of the World Heritage Committee. Uh, there were 21 similar missions in-country which were undertaken at the request of the relevant state party or the country that is party to the convention. And on top of that, there are 100 technical reviews. So these are things like management plans, which are submitted and formally expertly reviewed, um, comment on another 22 major issues, assessment of 28 um, funding applications, international assistance requests, um, and um, reports and reviews on 102 places that are on the World Heritage List. So if you can imagine a single state of conservation report might involve reviewing 700 or 800 pages of documents, which is then reduced into a very succinct report, which is submitted to and considered by the World Heritage Committee. So it's a very busy um, section of ICOMOS, very busy, busy unit of work. Um, now, in order to support some of that, ICOMOS also has a more global strategy where it proactively undertakes things like reports on gaps in statutory lists. It undertakes regional and thematic studies, conducts conferences and workshops uh, all over the world. There is development of principles and doctrinal texts and preparation of manuals and resources. I've already mentioned the documentation centre. And just some sort of examples of that, um, I've just flashed up on screen here, some examples of the thematic studies. So there's, there's one on the right there about properties, sites along the Silk Road, um, or about rock art in Central Asia. Uh, the large one on the screen is a, is a recent study on the cultural heritages of water. Um, and that has uh, contributed to and been supported by the recently established Global International Scientific Committee on the Heritage of Water, which is chaired by Ian Travers from Extent in Australia. And uh, this committee will have its first major meeting um, when we all gather in Sydney next year. Just let that earthquake settle down and mention that um, 
uh, one of the important things that ICOMOS undertakes is reactive monitoring missions. And these are where groups of experts, typically from ICOMOS and UNESCO, but sometimes from the other advisory bodies as well, will visit a property that, uh, where the attributes that support its um, outstanding universal value, in other words, the values that support the World Heritage Inscription have been affected and will provide expert advice to the state party. And a good recent example of that um, is a series of reactive monitoring missions that have been undertaken to Kathmandu in Nepal in the wake of the 2015 earthquake. And the ECOMOS expert who's been at the centre of that is Catherine Forbes from GML Heritage. And um, the work of these missions informs UNESCO and the Nepalese government about uh, appropriate approaches, resourcing needs and strategies for conservation management and appropriate reaction to the to the circumstances of the earthquake. Um, but it's not always something as dramatic as an earthquake. So the, the other kind of work that of which ICOMOS does um, far more is what are known as technical reviews. And so, for example, here is the stone town of uh, Zanzibar in Tanzania, or World Heritage Property, where there was a proposal for a new hotel development that could potentially affect uh, the property and so the kind of work that ICOMOS will do here is it will assign one or two experts who will review the documentation, prepare a short technical report and provide expert advice um, to the relevant um, national authorities and of course to the World Heritage Centre and where appropriate to the World Heritage Committee. Um, ICOMOS also provides direct advice to the committee through preparing um, what are called state of conservation reports for each committee session and then attending the committee sessions to provide uh, briefings and um, you know one of the more recent um, prominent decisions arising from that process started way back in 2017 um, uh, in Krakow and that image is displayed before you on screen. Um, this was the instigation of a process that unfortunately led to the removal of the um, historic mercantile city of Liverpool from the World Heritage List at the committee session held um, online and in China um, in 2021. So all of what I've just been talking about is what's called state of conservation. It's, it's the properties that are already on the World Heritage List. But ICOMOS is also very actively involved in evaluating new nominations to the list. Again, we have a small full-time unit, a director with two specialists, and then 13 global advisors around the, uh, around the globe, um, two of whom are Australian, Crystal Buckley and Duncan Marshall. Um, then there are 20 panel members. So these are, all, these are assembled from around the world and they are people with various relevant experience or expertise. And of the 20 at the moment, I think three are Australian, uh, Peter Phillips, uh, Matthew Wincock and Sheridan Burke. And they are supported by a network of around 265 global experts, uh, some of whom work as volunteers, some of whom do um, assignments on the basis of a, of a reasonably modest honorarium. And all of that expertise feeds into the technical advice which comes before the World Heritage Committee when it's making decisions about which properties will go on the World Heritage List. And to give you some idea of the, the volume, um, at the most recent session of the committee, uh, which was an extended session, so it was um, larger than usual, uh, there were 49 new nominations, uh, six referred nominations, in other words, matters that have been considered before and came back, and 11 boundary modifications. And there's a lot of interest in this process because it's high stakes for the countries involved. Um, so um, I mentioned the panel of 20 people, and again, I'm not going to read all the, all the words that are on screen, except to say that the panel brings great strength to the World Heritage Evaluation process because it is multinational, multidisciplinary, and it provides um, a, a, a collegiate way in assembling uh, views from a range of experts into um, clear advice that is values-based rather than influenced by political or diplomatic considerations. And it's a highly transparent, highly rigorous um, process. Um, and of course, what happens inevitably is that World Heritage nomination is a very 
a political process. And so countries that get inscribed think the panel is wonderful and countries who have their nomination rejected or sent back think that the panel is rubbish. Uh, this um, image on screen, uh, a rather complex flowchart that works from the bottom up, just broadly explains uh, how much work and how many stages go into a World Heritage Assessment between the lodgement of a, a nomination with UNESCO to the referral to the ICOMOS network globally, be that the international committees, or scientific institutions, ECOMOS national committees, individual experts, various evaluations, an on-site technical uh, mission and evaluation, a uh, processing by the Paris World Heritage Unit, uh, not one but two meetings of the panel, and of course, interaction with the nominating country to make sure that any points of uncertainty or concern are clarified. So there really is an enormously comprehensive and um, thorough process which leads into uh, ultimately an ICOMOS report to the World Heritage Committee on whether or not a property um, should be inscribed on the list. Um, so what are the reports based on? Just quickly, there's the nomination dossier submitted by the country. There'll be a report by the in-country mission. There'll be independent re re research. And then there will be evaluation of documents by usually a large group of experts, um, ac uh, academics, scientific committees, uh, specialists, other associations. There'll be new information submitted by the state party, that is the nominating country, and there'll be consultation with the ECOMOS National Committee. Um, so all of that ultimately um, wraps up what ECOMOS does in terms of its World Heritage responsibilities. I mentioned earlier that ICOMOS has 29 international scientific committees and a very relevant one of those to highlight in this National Archaeology Week is the International Scientific Committee on Archaeological Heritage Management. And the way these committees work is that national committees um, will typically put forward suitably qualified and experienced experts who join these committees. And this committee is one of the larger ones. It has more than 250 members, uh, including a number of Australian members, one of whom will be nominated by the National Committee of the Australia Rikomos Executive Committee as the voting person, the voting member. And the roles of these committees are to provide advice to Rikomos and to the World Heritage Centre on management of archaeological sites and landscapes, and to assist with the technical committees. Sorry, this is with the technical mission. So, so this committee gets heavily involved in the content of the work done by ECOMOS with respect to archaeological heritage sites. And I think there you have on screen uh, the aforementioned Matthew Wincott in his role as a member of this committee uh, undertaking some technical work at the Jamon sites in Japan a couple of years ago. Um, and so this committee is actually very active and um, for those who are interested in international archaeological work and don't have the opportunities perhaps created at an institutional level by being part of an international program attached to a university or similar, this is another route um, for becoming associated with meeting relevant people um, and connecting with the international archaeological community. Uh, and this community has great, this community has great fun. I mean, if you look there at its annual meetings in recent years, Tanzania, Sicily, Leiden, well, that was a virtual meeting. Um, it's going to have a meeting in Dublin later this year. It conducts online webinars, it publishes and researches on archaeological heritage and tourism. And look, uh, any of these committees are easy to find via the um, ICOMOS website. If you simply Google International Scientific Committee ICOMOS, you'll find them all. Uh, and I think this committee most recently um, or relatively recently has been um, had its focus on um, uh, an online webinar, um, uh, Archaeological Heritage and Tourism, which was obviously um, based on this event, which happened as um, part of the, um, uh, the last Jedi in the Star Wars series I've only just noticed today. Um, obviously, they get to go to some really cool and interesting places. And so um, just a, a quick highlight of some uh, resources. It is, if you, if you haven't done so, and you have any interest in ECOMOS 
whatsoever, it really is worth having a quick poke around the ECOMOS International website. It's not that hard, www.ecomos.org. And there you'll find uh, what I mentioned earlier, the, the documentation centre and its online resources. There is an open archive with a lot of um, e-prints uh, related to cultural heritage. There's a photo bank. Um, there's the websites of the International Scientific Committees. And there's a whole lot of other stuff that's absolutely worth connecting with if you're, you're at all um, substantively involved in the cultural heritage sector. Now, Australia ECOMOS has um, one of the most productive and active ECOMOS memberships in the world. Uh, we have between seven and 800 members here, which on a per capita basis uh, is all over anybody else. And we certainly punch above our weight in terms of contributions as experts, panel members. And I think we've constantly had a member of the ECOMOS board and often vice presidents or other office bearers uh, certainly since I first became involved uh, internationally in the early 1990s. And the really exciting thing for Australia is that in August, September next year, we will be hosting the 21st Triennial General Assembly of ICOMOS uh, in Sydney between the 31st of August and the 9th of September. And you're all invited. Um, it'll be the first time there's been a General Assembly um, in Australia or the Pacific. Uh, I should acknowledge that it's only possible because of the wonderful government uh, and private sector support that we have, particularly from the New South Wales and Australian governments, and that there will be a full 10 day program with a whole series of core activities and a really amazing array of side events and pre and post tours. Um, it's got various components. I think there's a total of around 110 events spread across 10 days. Um, Oh, 10 days plus the pre and post tours. Um, there's all the reasons that we come together in terms of ECOMOS business meetings and passing resolutions and noting accounts. There'll be a youth forum um, held on Cockatoo Island. There'll be a very major um, heritage exhibition held at Darling Harbour, um, a series of Sydney-based and regional side events, and then tours uh, to other parts of Australia a four-day scientific symposium, a very major conference, multi-themed relating to cultural heritage and a series of pre and post tours. And we've got quite a substantial um, organising arrangement, um, including um, independent advice from an Indigenous advisory panel, as is obviously um, appropriate. The scientific symposium will be on the theme of heritage changes with sub-themes of resilience, responsibility, rights and relationships. Uh, Four-day program will include a visit for every delegate to the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area and there will be traditional owner climate change and nature culture uh, cross-cutting streams and sessions. Uh, for those of you who know him, Steve Brown is the Australian co-chair of this and there is a, an international co-chair, Dr. Erna Balikas, um, uh, also contributing and this symposium is, is conducted by an internationally globally drawn scientific committee uh, and the call for papers and sessions will be coming out in July this year. Uh, just to put this in context, we were trying to host this event um, in 2020 and at that stage there were a, for the 2020 event more than 600 abstracts submitted, um, some of which were for entire sessions. Um, so this, this will be informative but it will also be heaps of fun because there will be didactic normal kind of conference sessions but there will be interactive sessions, site visits, uh, exhibitions, uh, provocations um, and it will be um, enormously engaging to be there. I've mentioned a few times the International Scientific Committees um, and each of them, all 29, will be having an event in Sydney. Sometimes it will simply be a meeting, others will have things like a two-day symposium and I know that the uh, International Committee for Archaeological Heritage Management will be having either a one or two day symposium at the Big Dig Archaeology Education Centre in the Rocks in Sydney. And that's, I should acknowledge, uh, particularly supported by the GA2023 principal archaeology sponsor being the Australasian Society for Historical Archaeology. So thanks very much to them. Um, and there will also be down at Darling Harbour a, a major exposition uh, display, including uh, content provided 
um, by um, each of these committees. And this will be an exhibition that's open to the public as well as to delegates. I mentioned the Youth Forum, and that will be hosted on Cockatoo Island. And it's for 120 to 150 delegates from around the world. Um, it'll be a two to three day program running Friday, Saturday, uh, Sunday, leading into the main um, assembly and scientific symposium. And it's actually you know, well underway and being organised by a very active and enthused subcommittee of uh, Australia ICOMOS um, members. And there's this additional social program. Um, the opening ceremony will be held at the, the Sydney Opera House. Um, one night we're taking over Luna Park, uh, our Art Deco amusement park, just for fun. Uh, there'll be some special inspections of Hyde Park Barracks, part of the Australian um, Convict Sites World Heritage property. There'll be a public lecture at the Sydney Town Hall. I've mentioned the exposition. Um, the members of our, the International Advisory Committee are having a Lord Mayoral reception, and then there'll be a gala dinner at the Convention Centre. So um, as well as the kind of cerebral content, this will be an absolute gem of an opportunity to meet with international colleagues, to engage and to have a lot of fun um, enjoying amazing cultural places while doing so. There'll be a day in the Greater Blue Mountains. Um, so those who come to this event from around the country, around the globe, will get to um, experience three different World Heritage properties, Sydney Opera House, Australian Convict Sites, and the Greater Blue Mountains, uh, with a focus on some of its cultural values and great support from the New South Wales National Trust, the National Parks Service, um, Blue Mountains City Council, and of course, our friends, um, the Gundungurra, who are the First Nations traditional owners of the country um, which we will be visiting. I mentioned this is only possible, and here's the short advertisement, because of the amazing support that Australia ICOMOS is receiving from a range of public and private sector strategic partners, um, uh, logos of whom you can see on the screen and very strong financial support from our corporate patrons. And I make particular mention of the Murujuga Aboriginal Corporation, as some of you will know. Uh, the Murujuga uh, site area is um, very likely to be Australia's next nomination to the World Heritage List, and we're very proud to have an Aboriginal corporation as a, um, the, the highest possible level patron of this event. We are also very grateful to our major corporate patrons, um, Extend Heritage, GML Heritage, Lovell Chen and Earthcheck. Stay tuned, the next time I put this slide up, there'll be at least five logos at the bottom and maybe two at the top. And then a whole series of other corporate patrons um, who are supporting this amazing event in all manner of ways, from things like um, travel bursaries to support for individual events, supports for the keynote speakers or direct contributions to the youth forum. Uh, I won't mention everybody, but um, the gratitude is genuine and heartfelt. And if you're looking at this screen and don't see your corporate logo up there and think that perhaps it should be, please reach out to me at any time, 24-7. Um, would love to hear from you because there's still um, a little bit of white space on, on these patron supporter screens. So look, in summary, um, the 2023 General Assembly and Scientific Symposium is intended to um, be great fun itself, but also to leave a lasting legacy for cultural heritage and the communities and value and care for it in Australia and, gen and, general and globally. Um, for those who are tuned in this evening, it is um, a simply remarkable uh, networking and professional development opportunity an opportunity to meet and connect with traditional owners um, locally and globally, an educational um, opportunity for professionals and students. We'll be exchanging information, inspiring greater government interest. We will certainly be promoting heritage in both academic and popular media um, and looking to provide a boost in grassroots interest in heritage. So look, thank you. And I think I'm now going to I'll pass the baton to back to Tracy, who will um, take things from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard, for that gallop through um, the international work of ICOMOS and all the wonderful 
um, Jen, around um, the, the um, GA 2023 proposed for next year. So um, there will be time for questions at the end, everybody. So please um, record your questions in the chat if, if you would like to do that or, or save them up. But now we're going to um, switch to up to Mianjin, Brisbane, um, and to uh, my old friend and colleague, Dr. Andrew Sneddon. Um, Andrew is the Director of Extent Heritage with a PhD in Archaeology from La Trobe um, University um, and diverse um, field experience in archaeology from around the world, but also, um, importantly, um, uh, a renowned specialist in the field of heritage law. Um, and for his sins, Andrew also has the daunting task of being the treasurer of, um, of Australia, um, ICOMOS. Um, we couldn't do it without you, Andrew. But Andrew's going to telescope back down into the local scale. Um, and uh, please make sure everyone you've got your chat box open um, so that we can send messages in that way. So the screen's yours, um, Andrew. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tracy. Yes, I'm in a terrible country in Brisbane, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners of that country. So you've heard um, Richard and Tracy mention the Borough Charter. Uh, the Borough Charter was written in 1979 in a town called Borough in South Australia, and it is um, Australia's premier guideline document for the management of heritage places. It's been in much the same form for decades now. We've had a few modifications now and then, but for the most part, the Borough Charters guided Australian heritage practice for a generation. And it's no exaggeration to say that there are very few written texts produced in Australia that have had quite the impact internationally that the Borough Charter has had. And the uh, uh, Australia ECOBOS is very proud of it. And so we were quite worried back in 2012 when I was on the executive committee, and we started getting feedback that some people were uh, not especially happy with the Borough Charter. Only small, a small number of people. Um, one of the criticisms was a familiar one you still hear sometimes today, and that is that the Borough Charter was written by architects for architecture, which is not true. Uh, most of the authors of the Borough Charter were not architects. However, it's um, a criticism leveled at the document from time to time. But as an archaeologist, uh, I was especially concerned to get the feedback from a small minority that archaeologists just did not use the Borough Charter, that it was not taught in universities to archaeologists and archaeology students, and that it was um, not being used and actually not widely known in archaeological circles. And that was my experience. At the time, I was working at the University of Queensland, surrounded by archaeologists, and, um, and uh, I must say, I didn't hear the words Borough Charter uttered very often. At one level, that's probably understandable because archaeology is a, a discipline that's got its own ontology. It's been around for centuries as a discipline and area of research. And so I suppose it's not especially surprising to learn that um, the Borough Charter was not being turned to that much. But it did trouble us because the Borough Charter is a highly significant document used worldwide for the management of heritage places. So we decided to try to address this issue by writing a practice note that called the Borough Charter and Archaeological Management. And it was written in, in tandem with another one called the Borough Charter and Indigenous Cultural Heritage Management. And the idea was to just remind those archaeologists out there that the Borough Charter exists and applies to the archaeological profession as much as the heritage profession more generally. So in, we, in writing the, um, the practice note, we uh, first of all disseminated a draft of Borough Charter and archaeological management. And we sent it to uh, government agencies and professional bodies like Austra the Australian Archaeological Association and ASHA and AMA and ACCA and the like. And we got um, some positive feedback, mostly it was positive. We often got no feedback. <clears throat> and in a couple of cases, we got quite negative feedback along the lines of, but out, what does ICOMOS think it's doing? Leave archaeology to the archaeologists. 
rather than allow that to put us off, it just reinforced us in our view that we needed to produce the practice note to emphasize for archeologists that they're part of a wider profession and heritage profession and, uh, and that the Borough Charter is a, a hugely influential and useful document to them. So tonight I'll just give you a quick crazy of what this practice note says. It's nine years old now and is being used. And I'm, I was gratified to hear a manager of a World Heritage Site recently refer to it and the Borough Charter as a management tool for the management of that World Heritage Place. So the practice note, in my view, says nothing controversial. It really just distills a bunch of principles uh, as common sense. And it starts by saying, dear archaeologists, the Borough Charter does apply to archaeological sites. That is, it, apply, it applies to heritage places and the definition of place in the Borough Charter is very wide and certainly captures archaeological sites. The Borough Charter also defines cultural significance to include scientific significance. So the practice note makes the observation that archaeology being a, a, a matter of scientific significance is captured by the Borough Charter. Oops, sorry, I bumped my computer. <laughs> so, what that means is that when uh, archaeologists come to a heritage site, an archaeological site, the Borough Charter would ask them to apply what we call the Borough Charter process in inverted commas. It's not a surprising or controversial process. It says that the management of a heritage place involves rigorous research to obtain a comprehensive understanding of that place. And only then can you assess the significance of that place. And once you've done that, the next step is to devise your management regime. Nothing controversial, and most archaeologists would do that intuitively. But it's nice to be able to turn back and turn to the Borough Charter and say, this is, let's say to a client, if you're a commercial practitioner or a government agency, if you're an academic, and say, this is why I am excavating this site in the way that I am. The practice note also notes that However, heritage places can be significant for more than their scientific or archaeological data. A place can embody also spiritual significance and social significance or even aesthetic significance. And so it refers archaeological practitioners to the golden rule of the Borough Charter. And that is when you approach a heritage place, do as much as necessary, but as little as possible. Intrude on that place or in as, as little as as much as you need to but no more in other words if you have research questions that can be addressed by excavating 10 percent of a heritage place we'll stop at 10 percent you don't have to excavate the whole thing leave a little bit for for future generations of archaeologists or for those people who might value the place for social reasons or spiritual reasons for example so the other reason for our practice note was because we received some feedback from government agencies, consent authorities, you might call them, that some archeologists were just digging stuff up because it's fun and doing nothing else, not thinking about the sites holistically, walking away and not considering the ways of using the archeology span to tell the story of the heritage place. Certainly archeologists, uh, well, the good archaeologists publish in an academic forum, but we must not forget that the general public is also deeply interested often in archaeological uh, places and want to hear the full story. So the practice note tried to emphasize for archaeologists that, that they should be thinking about heritage interpretation as well as academic publication. And they should think about the physical conservation of archaeological features in situ. So for example, they might become part of a heritage interpretation program. I guess the practice note was trying to reinforce for archaeologists that their obligations to a site don't stop with the digging or an academic journal publication. It also tried to reassure archaeologists that their borough charter is is not trying to tell them they can't do their jobs. It's often said that archaeology is an inherently destructive process. 
which I suppose it is, but it's destructive in order to be productive. It yields data. And so we made the point in the practice note that conservation in the Borough Charter is defined broadly to include all of the processes of looking after a place so as to retain its cultural significance. So archeological excavation, although some people say it's destructive, is in fact a productive activity that can, that does fall within the definition of conservation. That being said, the practice note also emphasized for um, archeologists that they must be uh, responsive to the views of people outside of their discipline. And that includes, for example, Aboriginal people, of course, some are archeologists, but Aboriginal people who might value place for different reasons and historical societies and the general public. So we do point archeologists in the practice note to academic publication, but also other forms of engagement, including public archeology. span And that's consistent with the Borough Charter generally, which urges the, co uh, the management of coexisting heritage values. Uh, it encourages archeologists not to stop with the science, but also, also to think of their archeological sites as places that might embody heritage significance for some people like First Nations people. Uh, there might be built heritage on an archeological site. Um, that requires a, a, you know, a careful approach to to place, you don't want to excavate under a significant building to find less significant archeology, span for example. That, that part of the practice note was a response to the views expressed by some people, I don't want to overstate it, but some people who, who said, we're archeologists, we're scientists, and that's what we need to do. Of course, there's always, always a place for specialists but it's important, I think, and the practice note tries to reinforce this, for archeologists to think beyond the microscopes or um, the trenches. And so finally, the practice note reminds archeologists to occasionally stand up and stretch their legs in the trench and look a little bit around them to try and uh, find where the archeology span fits within a broader setting. Um, landscape archeologists do this all the time, of course, and phenomenologists in archaeology, but an archaeological site is more than a series of one by ones or four by fours or something. It forms part of a landscape. It might interact with other heritage elements in a landscape that we call um, that we call setting. So uh, that's where I'll, I'll finish. The practice notes objective was to remind archaeologists that although there's a, always a place for specialists, um, we need to approach heritage places holistically. And we encourage those people who want to do a little bit more to think of themselves as heritage management, HAP managers, as much as archeologists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. And um, thank you for responding so quickly to <laughs> my message to, to wind up. Um, but I'm sure that there's lots of questions. You can see a few comments in the chat. So while we um, gather our, we've got a few moments for questions. So while you gather your thoughts, I'll just note that there is a, um, a comment from um, Max Burke AM, one of the found, founding fathers, if I might use that term, um, of, of Australia ICOMOS. Um, stating that, yes, Andrew um, is correct in that right from the, the founding of Australia ICOMOS, archaeologists were actively involved in every aspect of its work, um, as well as its, its administration within the Australian government. In the 1970s, there were very few archaeologists in Australia covering the emerging fields of archaeology of First Nations through to industrial archaeology. <coughs> Um, Caroline, is it possible for people to ask their questions in um, uh, in person, or um, can we only use the chat? Well, Q and A. Um, actually, I'll just have a look there. I, we, I can, I think, elevate people to panelists, promote to panelists um, if they have a question. Um, okay, and that right. will enable us to see and hear from them on video. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I just wonder if Max would like to expand on that point at all if he's online. Um, well, he might not be, but um, we also have a comment from Ramey Wood, if I've pronounced his name correctly, um, who has zoomed in from Tarana River in Alaska um, to join the conversation. Thank you so much, Ramey, for, um, for joining um, and um, expressing your thanks for the, um, the presentations. Um, I've got a quick question. Uh, I guess if anyone has a question, just maybe say you've got a question in the chat or Q&A, but just in the meantime, I just wanted to ask what it's been like working for ICOMOS um, over the last couple of years during COVID, what sort of challenges that's thrown up? Yeah, thanks for that question, um, Caroline. That's a really good one. Um, Richard or Andrew, would you like to um, give a perspective? Um, well, Richard, I, thanks. I, I'd just say in terms of international ICOMOS activities, um, that has been increasingly challenging. A lot of the um, processes that I spoke about regarding world heritage have obviously become much more challenging. Um, uh, it hasn't been an, uh, easy or, or often possible to undertake in-country site evaluations. And from the point of view of the Australians who are involved in this process, uh, some of us have become very tired because meetings are inevitably held um, in uh, European timeframes or at least uh, nighttime timeframes in Australia to suit our friends in the Americas Caribbean. So um, look, more challenging, but I think also we've become more adept at um, relying on documents. And there are, there are some sort of international uh, treaty and protocol issues where, and we see that at the moment with Ukraine and with some sites in the Arab region where it's all very well for us to receive images generated through social media, but it's not necessarily possible to use them as evidence in an in international diplomatic treaty context. Um, so look, I guess like everything else, it's, it's been challenging. Um, for Australia, Rick and Moss, we had the huge challenge of having to um, realise that we could not host the Global General Assembly in 2020. And we're very lucky that the International ICOMOS Board agreed to place it with Australia for 2023 and very lucky that our sponsors have stuck with us and that both governments, New South Wales and Australia, have uh, helped us with a little more cash. So thanks to everyone for all of that. Thanks, Richard. Would you like to add a comment to that, Andrew? Um, I don't do as much World Heritage work as Richard, but I've I found myself doing a lot more desktop reviews, reviewing, um, reviewing uh, mostly environmental impact assessments for large projects that might impact World Heritage places in Southeast Asia. I did three of them, I think, and it was all done via um, on the desktop, frustratingly. Mm, yeah. Yes, I think we've all changed. Um... Um, our manner of working in some ways. I mean, my experience working within a university is, is that um, I found that all of the different universities around Australia had slightly different responses to um, the COVID situations in their own um, regions. Um, my own university had a total ban on, on, on all travel for a very long time. Um, and I got a bit frustrated where I saw my colleagues who work for consulting companies, they were still going out and doing field work where I was um, unable to travel to some of my field sites um, over the pandemic um, period. So, you know, there was a bit of cognitive dissonance between the different sectors. Um, and that's, I think, highlights um, the point that Richard made um, about how ECOMOS is an interesting uh, link up between those different sectors and I think um, my involvement in, in ECOMOS has you know helped to um, to maintain those linkages. Um, Max has added a few points um, about um, the origins of um, those uh, of ECOMOS's early work, work and pointed to the work of um, Isabel McBride, Joe Flood and, and John Mulvaney. 
um, for instance. But um, I suppose I would like to um, ask a question of, um, of um, Andrew and Richard, um, in particularly in this sort of post-COVID world, but even um, before that, um, archaeology in particular is an area where, you know, knowledge changes, has been changing so quickly. If you think of um, the deep time archaeology and um, stories about human origins and um, uh, the peopling um, of, of um, Australia and, and other continental land movements, it's changed so quickly um, over the last few years because of um, extended research, uh, different um, technological research tools. And I just wondered um, in terms of you know, world heritage listing, which, you know, in a way seems to embed the old stories. How do we marry up this, you know, what we see as this dynamic field of research where values are changing all the time and um, interpretations are changing radically with this, as, with this idea of um, world heritage, which, um, you know, tends to encapsulate something called um, outstanding universal value, if that value is, is, you know, is so subject to change. Andrew or Richard, you have a response? Well, it's, it's a, it is a, a tough one. Um, narrowing the lens a bit and just speaking in terms of Australia, I do a lot of Aboriginal Australian um, heritage. And um, what I'm encountering is um, quite challenging and sometimes because uh, I'll speak with an Aboriginal group who has quite recently reconnected with country, divorced from it or forced from it through the colonial um, process. And they're reconnecting and rediscovering sites and imbuing those places with relatively contemporary um, significance, high significance, but quite quite recent significance, and it's often expressed as highly traditional, but it might also equally be expressed as quite contemporary. So um, the challenge for someone like me is to try and document how, in what ways that is significant. Is something, is a, is a sacred site that's been sacred for five or 10 years as significant as Uluru or something like that? It's, it's a very difficult one, identifying the heritage is quite easy, um, but assessing its significance is quite difficult, guided by the Aboriginal people, of course, but then managing it, in a, especially in a development context, is becoming very, very challenging. Thanks, Andrew. Richard? I'll just comment um, quickly. I mean, firstly, the values themselves are mutable, as are the processes for understanding them, and there is no doubt that over the last 20 to 30 years, the, the skill set of the archaeological practitioner has needed to evolve to, to embrace a wider spectrum of values and skills, particularly, you know, skills of engaging with First Nations people or other traditional uh, custodians. In terms of the World Heritage System, it started out being Eurocentric. It is still Eurocentric. Um, there is a disproportionate um, World Heritage List and um, despite a lot of, this is a sort of personal comment, I guess, rather than an ECOMOS comment, despite a lot of rhetoric, um, those who already, those nations who already dominate the list continue to push forward nominations while genuinely trying to support um, uh, developing nations and, and Africa and the Pacific spring to mind particularly. But the reality of the circumstances in those places is that the rate of nomination will never catch the Italy's or Germany's, and yet they press ahead. So it is a systemic problem. It relates to archaeology. It relates to intangible values. But frankly, it relates to the entirety of the list and its credibility as representative of as being representative of what you know is valuable to humanity. Mm. Thanks, Richard. Yes, I think that touches on a couple of the, um, you know, the key issues for us as archaeologists in engaging in, in these discussions and um, ongoing um, uh, 
discourses at, at, the, go, at the global level. But I think um, our time is up um, for this evening. I hope for those um, who have Zoomed in, um, you've heard um, something new or something to interest you. Um, please contact um, any of us at Australia ECMOS if you're interested in um, joining in the discussion, um, particularly if you're interested in joining in um, the events around the GA um, next year. Um, we would love um, to hear from you and um, particularly, um, you know, I don't want you to go away with the impression that all of us in Australia ICMOS um, have this wonderful um, uh, field of um, accord and agreement. Uh, we have uh, rigorous uh, debates and differences of opinion um, and critique of, um, of our documents, including the Barra Charter is welcome, um, just as is um, the support and discussion of, of um, successful case studies. So I hope this has whetted your appetite for these debates. Um, Caroline, thank you so much for organising this evening's um, panel where, where um, it's been wonderful to participate. And I think you're gonna tell us about some of the exciting um, coming up, um, the exciting programs coming up for National Archaeology Week. Thank you, Tracy. 